Welcome back. My name's Gary, and this is going to be the seventh in a series of six videos uh, devoted to people like me that shoot with a DSLR without a guiding setup. Um, pretty basic equipment. But what we're trying to do is trying to get um, to a point like this, uh, ultimately to a point like this with a moderate amount of success. Now, one of the things uh, on my setup, anyways, that I have a lot of trouble with is chromatic aberration. I'm still working on a solution for that. But in this image, the uh, gradients are gone. Um, the background is uh, uh, a neutral color, and uh, any light pollution that was there has been erased through a couple of serial processes uh, that we've talked about in the past. Anyways, today um, I've been wanting to do more about Cyril, particularly some of the functions that I didn't touch on in my prior videos. We just did the basic things, important things, but the basic things. But a few weeks ago they released a, a new version as well, so there's a few new bells and whistles that I had um, hoped to go through with you a little bit. So we're going to uh, switch over to Cyril. There we are, and this is the uh, visible interface of the program, and uh, there's nothing loaded up or running right now. Um, there's been a few changes along the way, so I'm just going to kind of go in, in uh, progress. Now, if you've watched my prior videos, we, use, we used a script to uh, convert our images, build the sequences, pre-process them, and register them. And then that's where we stop, so we could do some manual stacking, uh, making choices like uh, filtering and whatnot. And there's been an improvement to that particular step. So I've got one set of registered pre-processed uh, lights in the process folder. So I'm just going to, on the command line down here, uh, tell serial to change into that directory. and then confirm up here what directory we're, we're actually in. And I'm in the console view right now, so everything that I do um, shows up there. Um, anyways, in this directory, we can search sequences, and there it is, the RPPP light sequence. So that is now loaded. We do not need to pre-process it. We do not need to register it. That's already been done. But because it's been registered, we have a plot here. And this is a measure of uh, full width, half maximum quality of the stars. And this has always been available. And there's kind of an average line here. I guess that gives you an idea of what you can expect. Now, at any point in time when you have a sequence loaded, down at the bottom right here, you can look at the, uh, at the frame list. There's a window there that pops it open and closed. So in this case, uh, Cyril has made a choice. Uh, reference frame is brown here. If we change the red channel here to green channel, that's where the quality measure comes in. So this reference frame 3.1 is probably the best image that's there. And because it's highlighted right now, it's loaded in this window. So we're in an auto stretch view. I'm going to go to RGB. Now this image has not been color calibrated yet. It's been debared. Um, which means that there's two green pixels for every red and blue pixel, so it's green. That's not a big deal. But anyways, what's new here, let me just click on this one. That's really way out there. See here, we can go exclude frame 35. Right from this graph, we can get rid of the real outliers if we want to. So I'm just going to click away from that. Let's have a look at frame 35. Okay, 8.3 for full width half maximum. So Cyril really didn't like that one. So let's have a look at it. Okay, so we have some star trailing. Even medium-sized stars are kind of oblong here. So I can see why it doesn't like that. So I'm just going to go back to the full view here. There's a buttons along here that control zoom levels. So I'm going to close this, but right away I'm just going to go exclude. And you know what? I don't really like these outliers either, so let's just exclude these. Okay, so now we're starting at 
6.6 um, full width half maximum. Now let's open up that frame list again and scroll through it. See there's one that's excluded, 7.3. So if you're the sort of person that wants to go frame by frame, see what they look like, make your own choices, you can just deselect them here and you can then exclude them from stacking if you want to. But I've just gotten kind of an automatic process that saves some trouble that way and I don't think I need to go any further. Now I'm going to go to the stacking tab. Um, these are all defaults, average stacking with rejection, normalization, additive with scaling. Um, this is all good. This is about pixel rejection up here, recapping. I use linear fit clipping. It's a newer thing than Sigma clipping. Um, so, so far I've been happy with it. I'm just going to leave it there. Now this part down here is about rejecting whole images. So the first filter here is selected. Now, if you don't want to exclude those pictures we selected in the plot or by checking them off, you would just change this to something else. But I'm going to leave that one there, and that guarantees that those will be filtered out of the stack. Now I might do another filter based on weighted full width half maximum and make some choice at this point. By default, we're using 90% of our images, and there's a measurement there of, of the quality so if we drop that down to 80%, we're now stacking 69 images. We're down to 16 and a half, and so it goes. So you can make choices, and then you could add another filter if you want to. Right here, we might do something based on roundness. But I mean, if you get too carried away, um, you're going to end up with a very small stack. So anyway, so that's, that's the first big change is that this... Uh, Plot and stacking has new functionality. Okay, now I just clicked away from the stacking tab and we lost those settings. So I guess if you're going to do that. So if I was going to actually run this stack, and I actually did run the stack on about 50 of them, I thought I'd use higher quality images and only stack 50. And I get a better quality image in terms of star quality, but way worse in terms of noise. So that's actually the image I'll be using throughout the rest of this video is a stack of about 50 of these. Um, so anyways, that's the first thing. Uh, and then of course, if you wanted to stack it, you would put in here a uh, dot dot slash, which tells it to drop that file in the directory above, which is Cyril's home directory, and then give it a file name as suits you. And then you just hit start stacking and in a minute or two, you'll have a stacked image there to start working with. I've already done that, not going to do that again, so we will leave that behind. The other thing I wanted to do while we're in this section is somebody did ask me on YouTube what happens if your camera takes fit frames. And Cyril automatically works with fit frames. So you can use the same scripts. You just put those fit files into your lights folder, your lights and so on with all of them. And rather than converting them, if it's a fit file, it might just put in a solid symbolic link and not even copy them. May or may not, depends how what kind of fit file you have, I suppose. If it uh, needs to be converted, it will be converted, and you'll get a sequence of light frames and a sequence of whatever other frames you use. So, um, but you can just use fit files straight out of your camera uh, in Cyril and just use the normal scripts, and it will deal with that. Okay. Um, and then, of course, when you do that conversion or creating symbolic links, that's what creates the sequence sequences. The sequence tab is just for choosing which sequence you're in. Um, so it's kind of cool. Okay, now I'm going to go back down to the command line and type close, which will close the open image. And now we're still in the process folder. First thing you always want to do when you're done there is get out of it. So cd dot space space. Otherwise, next time you open up Cyril, you might still be in that folder and you run a script and it won't find the subdirectories because you're starting in the wrong folder, so on and so forth. So it's just good housekeeping to do that. 
So let's open that stack of 50 I just talked about. Uh, I've done pre-processing on this one. I have done um, background extraction, which flattens the gradients across the image because there might have been light pollution or something that set up a gradient. So that's the first thing you do. You crop off the black borders, run a background extraction. Then I did a color calibration. Most of you have been through this, so I won't spend a lot of time where you pick a black area of the image and a white or nebulous area of the image, preferably not colored too much. Um, and it will basically set the black point, which gets, now that we flattened with background extraction, the uh, back uh, color calibration calculation will subtract away whatever is not black from the background, which gets rid of your light pollution. So that, those are two very important things. And then there's a bunch of other tools here we'll get to eventually, but at the moment we're talking about what's new in Cyril. So there's a new button down here. Now, in Cyril you can plate solve, and there's two ways to do that. In color calibration, you've got photometric color calibration. And so if you do a photometric calibration, color calibration, it's going to plate solve and it's going to color your stars and to some extent the background closer to the officially recognized colors. The other way to plate solve is up in here, image information, uh, image plate solver. It's the same window, except it's not going to do the photometric color calibration, but it's the same thing. In this case, I choose something that's in the image. Flame Nebula. And it's founded on a server, loaded in its sky coordinates, and then it needs to know your focal length of your lens and the pixel size of your camera. And uh, then you can just hit OK. So it's fine star processing, it's submitting, OK. 13 pair matches, blah, blah, blah. Um, so now we're plate solved. And this makes, sorry, hit OK instead of cancel. This makes this new button down here active. Um, you can hit this and it'll overlay um, known items in the neighborhood, whatever's in the field of view. Now there's NGCs here, there's ICs, uh, there's an M, a Messier, and there's a couple of other catalogs available. And for that, you need to go to Preferences. There's a new section here called Astrom Astrometry. So there's also a lens catalog and a star catalog. So depending on which one of these ones you have ticked is what will come up on this image. Um, so I, I deselected those because it got real cluttered in around Casper Nebula here. Um, Lot of stuff in there, I guess. So, anyways, but if, if you want to make adjustments, ex exclude Messiers or only have Messiers, you do it here, and then uh, and then you can do that. Now, of course, you're not going to export a TIFF after stretching like this. Um, kind of make it a mess, you know, when you're doing your post post processing. But there's another new button up here, top right. See my mouse? It's a little camera icon says take a snapshot of your displayed image. So this is still a linear image. I just happen to be in an auto stretch view. If I wanted to take a snapshot of the red channel, I would do that. I'm going to take a snapshot of the RGB. So all I have to do is hit that camera. You get no choices. It's going to save off as a partial size uh, PNG file, which is a portable network graphic. It's a valid image file. It tells you it did it, and let's go have a look in that folder. It just dumps it into Searle's home directory. So there it is. And there it is. So if you want to make an image like that along the way or at different stages of processing, you can just do that at will. And the file name is based on a timestamp, so it'll never a new one will never overwrite an old one. Okay, so we have covered this, can just be toggled on and off. 
and the plot. I think that is the majority of the new functional stuff in Cyril. Um, there's always fixes under the hood and that kind of stuff, but uh, those are beyond my scope. So the second part of this is going to be looking at some different um, tools that Cyril has. Um, so far in my prior videos we talked about color calibration. I never change colors, so saturation is kind of off limits for me, but it's there. Remove green noise. Um, I'll remember how green those images were. Sometimes even after color calibration there's some green noise left behind, so that just wipes it out. Negative transform. Don't really know why you'd want to do that. Um, they actually have down here, by the uh, view button, a negative view transform. So if you want to, if there's something you're looking for that you want to find in negative, that's probably an easier way to do it. Okay, let's stay to the simple ones. Banding reduction. That is a algorithm designed for certain Canon cameras that leave banding in their images, especially in the deep darks, and then when you stretch them, they show up. So you have a, a few adjustments to make here, and you can go from horizontal to vertical, depending on what kind of banding you have, and apply it. My camera's a Nikon. I've never had to use that, so it's kind of irrelevant. Contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization. I'm just going to go with defaults, and it doesn't do anything good for this kind of image. We're still linear too, so I really don't quite get that one, but it's there. If you have a use for it, be my guest. Uh, cosmetic correction. This is one I would run every time because I don't do darks in the winter. My camera doesn't have problems when it's below freezing outside. But cosmetic correction will detect single pixels that are at full luminosity. And so the standard settings are cold and hot sigma at three. I click CFA uh, color filter array. That's what kind of, that's what I have in my camera and then hit apply. Now if you look over here, it says in the console, it says 1050 corrected pixels. So it found 1050 um, hot pixels and has set them back to a neutral color nearby them or not to full black probably but it's not visible to me so I, I'll really never know what it exactly did but that was a new adjustment for this pre-processed fit file so I'm just going to hit save and lock it in I don't ever have to do that again because I just saved the file okay um Cosmetic correction. We'll come back to deconvolution. Median filter. Median filter is a smoothing filter that is pretty good at preserving edges. So let's just hit apply. And with this chromatic aberration, it kind of spreads it out, smears it. It did not, in this case, clean up the background noise. So I'm not going to leave that one. There are other tools that are better for... Uh, for smoothing um, after we've exported this image. Um, but that's what it does. I had another image, North American Nebula, where the uh, median filter did very good things for the image. So it's a case-by-case -case situation. Rotational gradients haven't been there, don't really want to. Geometry is just your rotating and mirroring, which have shortcut buttons at the bottom right here where my mouse is. Background extraction. That one has been covered thoroughly in the prior videos. This is just where if you have gradients, you can generate this grid. Right click to, sorry, you cannot be in the RGB window for that. Just right click on any that reside on nebulosity or things you don't want to have absorbed into the background. And then hit apply and it will flatten the background to a flat black. i um, not going to do that because it's been done already and this time around it will absorb stuff that I don't want absorbed. So back to RGB. Extraction. Okay, this might be interesting to people who um, shoot RGB and then have a hydrogen alpha filter. 
you can split the channels here into just RGB. I would stick with uh, RGB color space. You get your three channels saved as individual FIT files in Cyril's home directory. And then if you wanted to, you could take your red one and in other software modify it with your hydrogen alpha, uh, which you've probably also processed here. And then there's another thing, RGB compositing, where you can rebuild that image from whatever you want to use as your red image, your green image, and your blue image. And if you have a hydrogen alpha layer, you can also import that to use as a luminance layer. And uh, this is capable of running a fine star. Uh, what you would do is, can, can, can't be in the RGB to do anything, but if I just went like this, and came back here, um, if I had panels loaded up here, this align button would be illuminated, and you'd be able to align those layers um, using um, the fine star lining, lining up that group of stars. So I think that kind of covers that one. Um, if you do a compositing, it'll close your old image. It's expecting to create a new one. So you'll lose any unsaved edits, which is why I hit save right after I did the cosmetic correction edit. It's still there. Um, okay, so let's go back to open. We'll go back to this uh, image again, same one. So let's look. I've heard people talk about deconvolution. And this one... This one, I think, is intended for people who have a guided setup and whose stars are nearly perfect. I mean, theoretically, a star is many, many, many light years away. And so its light, if you were up in space, would probably just hit one pixel or slight overlap onto a second one on a sensor. But because we're shooting through the atmosphere, the light gets convoluted. It hits more than one pixel. And so this deconvolution algorithm is designed to try to correct that. But it doesn't do wonderful things for an image like this, where the stars look like that. Now that's with the preview turned on. So you can turn down the radius, maybe in the half range, hit preview again. And you see how it kind of made the stars a little smaller? But in my case, it just reveals more of the chromatic aberration, so not a great effect. Now, the contrast threshold, if you had stars that only spanned four or five pixels, it should spin one or two. Um, you'd use this contrast threshold to find that level to separate the effect it has on the stars from the effect it has on everything else. But this is set to auto, and I've played with it. I can't get enough separation here to not affect everything else. So if you look, it also sharpens up the noise. So deconvolution, I wouldn't play with it too much unless you have near perfect images and you think it might be useful to you. Fournier transform. Again, that's not so much for us. If you have a big picture of Saturn, and there's weird wiring patterns in the rings. What this does is it transforms your image into a modulus and a phase file. And it'll export it into Cyril's home directory. And then right after you do that, you can go inverse, inverse transform and select those two files it created. And somewhere along the way, it gets rid of those weird patterns you might find in, in Saturn's rings. And again, I've tried it with some of my images. I cannot find any effect. And I think it's just because at our level of equipment, um, we don't have enough quality to even see the problem, let alone see the solution. So again, my opinion that you're welcome to play with stuff like that if you wish. OK, linear match. Uh, this is a way. If you have an H alpha image, that you can line it up with another image. Um, Cyril has a script uh, built in. Um, 
extract HA, extract HA03, and it uses that function to line up those two images after they've been processed from your lights. So again, it's beyond uh, what most of us would do with a DSLR on a, on a uh, tracker. Now the other thing that's interesting is up here we have undo, redo, and pretty much anything in here except for like uh, extracting layers that can't be undone at new file um, on the hard drive kind of thing. But pretty much anything else here can be undone. There's also some functions via the command line, but anything you do there cannot be undone. So you want to hit save if you're not sure what you're doing before you run that command, because then you can just reopen the image and start from where you left off. I'll give you an example. There is a function called DDT, and that is a serial command. And if you want to know more information about a command, it takes parameters. Uh, you just hit this lifeboat, and it'll give you a bit of an explanation about the command that you've entered. Uh, can it be used in a script? No. So this performs a digital development processing um, algorithm, um, which is a type of sharpening. Um, this is kind of in the realm of raw editors like uh, Darktable. But my understanding of it is you give it a, a light level and it splits the image into two based everything above that light level is part of one image, everything below is part of the other one. And it, I believe what it does is a linear stretch on the level below and a nonlinear stretch on the level above and multiplies the two together uh, based on the parameters parameters that it takes. So there's a level parameter. Um, it has a sigma parameter, um, which I believe has to do with the amount of blurring, and the coefficient is the amount of multiplication. So again, this is one, just learned about it a couple of days ago, limited use for us, I think, but I'm just going to try it. So let's take um, 2600 is our level. So I, and again, I'm not sure the scale here. I'm, there are ways to measure the average um, luminosity of the image, and then you can make inferences from there. But just for fun, uh, let's try two as a sigma and a coefficient of 1.8. Um, I've been playing with these, and this is something that's not too destructive, but I haven't really got it optimized either. And I'll hit enter. So, what did it do? Again, with the uh, chromatic aberration, it made the core of the star, it did a star reduction, it made the core of the star smaller, but also left behind more of the chromatic aberration. So it's, it's not really great for me. Um, the quoted case for using it is if you have a galaxy with a bright core. Apparently this process can even the luminosity of the galaxy a lot because the brighter part of the stretch uh, gets divided into itself and, I'm sorry, multiplied into itself and uh, multiplication is a darkening effect and anyways. There is some mysterious stuff in here. That some would call it advanced. Um, I don't think I have time to do that every night when I come home with images. So I can't undo that. There's nothing to undo. So the only way to undo it is reopen the image, which was saved before that was done. So, so I think that kind of covers it. Um, the new stuff is this overlay function. There's a take a snapshot button. In the plot tab, if you have a sequence loaded, um, you can deselect images from your stack right there before you stack. Uh, we, if you have a sequence loaded, you can fire up the frame list and look at any frame in there, uh, evaluate its quality and uncheck it if you want to exclude it from stacking. And I think that's about it. 
Now, I've been devoting some time recently. I have bad chromatic aberration in most of my images, so that's been kind of my challenge. I mean, look at this one. If I do an arc sine stretch on this, these stars are going to have a white core and a very bright and encircled ring around them. And I've been having trouble figuring out how to deal with that. Well, let's just have, an ex have a look as an example. Uh, that This uh, preview auto stretch is a histogram stretch, which washes out a lot of colors. Generally, I believe it better to go with an arc sine stretch, at least for part of the process. So I'm going to just do something like that. And again, sorry, let's just get to a full view here. Okay, and then let's just switch over to a histogram stretch to finish that off. Okay, now that is applied, but I have not hit save, so the original fit file um, is still unstretched. So now if we look at these stars, see that's pretty bad. But I found a piece of software that can deal with that, and a lot of other stuff too. In fact, I don't really even want to denoise this image in Cyril because um, this other software I'm kind of learning, and I'm almost ready to do a YouTube on it, would come after Cyril, but before Photoshop or GIMP. Uh, it's a raw processor, but it works very well, except for a couple of things on uncompressed TIFF files. And it, it's called Darktable. It's kind of the free alternative to Lightroom. But uh, the author of Darktable does things differently, and uh, in some cases extremely effectively, but you got to get your head around the way things work. So that will be my next YouTube, and it will be the start of a new series. This is the conclusion of the intro to success series, if you will. Uh, the biggest thing I wanted to bring to you was Cyril, because it gives you things like background extraction in a linear state, which you don't have unless you get one of the mainline expensive packages. So I think we'll wrap that one up here. I just wanted to show you very quickly um, this image. Let's uh, give that an auto stretch just to bring it into contrast. Um, so this is kind of pretty close to what I exported into Darktable, and I'm not done this one yet. But this is kind of where I'm at. I got the darks lifted away from pure black. I got the brights to a point where they're nowhere near blowing out. So there's lots of room to stretch more. And I think I finally defeated chromatic aberration at the expense of some blurring. Um, that was the main thing I went into dark table for. And then I found some other cool things in there as well. So. This is kind of um, working without dark table. Uh, that's overstretched. It's something I did as an experiment to bring out the luminosity. And this is what I started with to create this one. But I'm thinking that with dark table, that's what we have. It's a better starting point. I have to do a star reduction or a star net star removal. And then you have more flexibility in bringing the stars back into the image. But uh, there's a lot of potential here. So anyways, I think we are done with Cyril. Again, I have not hit save. So my original image, oh, one other thing commands here. You know about change directory. If there's an image loaded, you can just type in close. It'll unload it. Anytime you leave Cyril, Double check that it's in its home directory so you're not messed up next time you start. And if you want to see all the command line stuff, you can tip, type help. And in the console here, it will give you a list of every command that's available. So that's helpful. 
it's not extremely informative, but then you can just do a Google search on any given command, Cyril plus the command, and you'll be taken straight to an explanation. Um, so I think, sorry, I'm just dealing with the screen capture software here. I'm headed off to the uh, mountains. Um, to an area like this in a couple of days. We're going to do some skiing, and there's at least one clear night forecast, so I'm hoping to do some starry landscape stuff, which I've never done. And I'm actually working on a script in Cyril where you could feed a set of tracked light images uh, to stack and create a sky image, and then you could set, you know, give it a set of three, four, five untracked images that it can stack to give you as good a foreground as possible. So I'm working on a script that uh, will do that. You just put the tracked ones in one folder, the untracked ones in a different folder. It will apply calibration frames to both, and then generate two files, one for your stack sky and one for your stack ground, which then you would have to blend in other software. But uh, that's another ongoing project, and when I'm ready with that, I will uh, publish again. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you found this useful. I just wanted to make people a little bit more aware of some of Cyril's more advanced capabilities. Although, honestly, the background extraction, color calibration, you flatten your background, you subtract out the light pollution. If you have a lot of light pollution, that might leave you with very little net signal between the light pollution and the nebula or whatever you're photographing. But at least you'll have a clean background and you can work with what's left of the nebulous um, difference, I suppose you could say. Always better to shoot in dark skies. Um, then there's just way less to subtract, so you have more to work with. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I will uh, revisit again before too long. Thank you.